Guys, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the hospitality class. So, uh, this is the first time we've ever taught anything on hospitality, so it's a new thing, you know? So, um, I'm just going to shut up and let my wife say everything. Yeah, really. But, uh, you know, one of the uh, qualifications for being an elder is you need to be hospitable. In other words, you need to like to have people over into your house and uh, you know, like, like to entertain and, and make things special. I want to start off in Matthew uh, chapter 27. Come on, bro. <clears throat> Hopefully today we're going to give you some things that are going to be very, very practical for you uh, to help you. But here again, uh, hospitality really starts in your heart. Yeah. It's a mindset. It, it's an attitude of wanting to serve instead of being served. Matthew chapter 27. I'm getting there. Actually, Matthew chapter 22. I can't even read my own writing. That's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Matthew 22. Verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. You know, it's, we've always used this parable before when we talked about how awesome this wedding banquet must have been. You know, I used to do Bible talks about that. You, can, you know, you ask people, say, what do you think was there? You know, all your favorite dishes. And, oh, yeah. you know, it was all spread out. And they had the silver there and the linens. And, you know, you, you think about going to a wedding banquet. You think about something special like that. And you think, you know, you think it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, really, th that's the way hospitality needs to be, okay? Yeah. The first thing about hospitality I want to talk about today is, is the fact, number one, is that it, it creates memories. Yeah. Okay? It creates memories in people's minds. You know, I've shared about this before. I mean, just the impact of going over to Ron and Linda Brumley's house. How I was totally blown away the first time I ate dinner over there. I couldn't even eat. I was, and that's pretty amazing for me. But, you know, I, I, I know. I couldn't eat. I was so blown away at their hospitality. But I can remember going over there for a Thanksgiving meal. And, uh, you know, the Brumleys are elders, serve as elders in uh, Chicago. And, um, uh, but I remember going over there, you know, and everything was just spread out so beautifully. Uh -huh. and, and you walk in, you walked in there, you know, and it was just a, a warmth. There was a, an intimacy. Uh -huh. that there was an atmosphere that we're going to talk about, you know, in a little while. But, but I remember, you know, sitting down and having that meal, and we talked about, you know, he had everybody stand up and say, now, it's one, one, one thing you're grateful for before we ate. And, you know, that was, came out of a non-Christian background, you know, you, Thanksgiving, you get the food on the table, you, you wolf it down, and then you go watch, you know, the, the football game. That's all you do, you know? And, um, you know, I remember doing that. I remember walking away, and I remember, you know, I remember thinking, man, that, that had an impact on me. Yeah. I mean, that was a memory. I, I mean, I, I still remember that today. I remember the setting. I remember everything about it. I remember the love. The love permeated mm -hmm. the whole room. And, uh, you know, We've got to have those kind of memories, you know, not, and we're going to talk about that, not just in our own lives, but in people that we're reaching out to, you know, that, that things that we do, you know, the Christian life is built on memories, mm -hmm. you know, you become a disciple, you never forget when you were baptized, you know, getting married, in, you know, in the church, these disciples never forget that, these, their marriage retreat, it's a memory, mm -hmm. you know, and, and hospitality is creating memories. Mm. And, you know, I, I um, what, at that time when we, were, we weren't Christians yet and we were going over to different people's houses and I thought, this is really different. I mean, I don't, I don't ever remember people being so giving and just, and they'd always get out their nicest things. You know, they, it wouldn't be like they'd, you know, throw a submarine sandwich in front of me and say, what soft drink would you like? It was always really nice. I mean, we didn't eat pizza every time we went to somebody's house. It was meals that were really well prepared and they'd put a lot of time into making it special for us. And so that just was what I just thought Christian women did. I mean, I didn't know anything else. And, and that was really great for me because being trained in that kind of an environment as a young Christian is what set hospitality in the right place in my heart. And I loved it. And I'd, I'd just sort of sit at Linda's feet and try to figure out, okay, now how's she doing this? And I, you know, I'd, I'd always tried to have nice meals for my family and stuff, but I didn't really know how to put, to, I've never been raised in a home where you figure out how to put meals together and do things like that. And so I'd just hang around with all these people and ask them, you know, what are you doing? And try to figure it out. And, um, 
And, and that was a really fun thing, and it became our family then. I mean, our kids were very little when we became Christians. They were like just turning three and four, and we had people over. No kidding. It must have been at least three nights a week that we'd have non-Christians over to our home, people, friends that we'd met. And I was a full-time professor at the time. Greg had two veterinary practices and worked probably 70 hours a week. But that was just what you did, and it was fun. And the kids loved it, and they put on little plays afterwards. And, I mean, it was just a family event. And they would make the placemats. And, I mean, it was just fun. And it was our life. That was what we did. And so we had, and in those days, you know, you go to church Sunday morning, all morning. You went to Sunday school and church. Then you had a meal after church every Sunday. Then you had church from 6 to 10 Sunday night. And then you had Bible talk one night, midweek, and you had a Friday night devotional. And those other nights you had people over. And, you know, it was, it was a great life. I mean, I, I actually, it, it was a time where, um, you know, you just were together as a family a lot. And our kids were a part of the whole thing. And so when we, um, when we moved to India, we took that with us which fit, out, fit really well in India because they're very hospitable people. But we would have, it was a little tougher there because I didn't have any hot water in my kitchen and oftentimes didn't have any water in my kitchen. So I'd have to carry buckets of water from the bathroom and we'd have to use it in the kitchen because we only got water once a day. And um, we had this little kind of Bunsen burner with two burners and this little teeny tiny refrigerator. So my kids really got into this routine of... Um, putting up with all my hospitality in India and we'd have these big meals and, and we'd have to wash all these dishes and and they'd have they'd have songs they would sing at different points along this dishwashing because you'd have to bring the water in and you'd have to boil the water and then you'd have to wash the dishes and you have to boil more water and then rinse the dishes and then I mean it took forever but it it created so many memories and I was thinking as we were um, coming in here today I thought gee I should have brought Jennifer and Matthew because if you were to ask them about hospitality, that's what they would, they would do. They would go through story after story after story of times where people were in our home yeah. and that it had such a big impact on them. You know, they loved it. And uh, now it's really funny because now they're at UCLA and they each have their own apartment over there and they are the most hospitable kids on the campus. I mean, they plan these big meals and they, Matthew sets up these great imaginative dates because... He learned that through being raised, you know, in a home environment where we just loved having people over. Man. <clears throat> you know, I know when we were, we, were in New York, we spent two years in New York and we came back from India, and, um, you know, the family meals are a time that you can really be hospitable. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times I think what we do is we, we, we get our family time and we, we kind of hog that for, just for ourselves. And um, I know one of the things I appreciate about Shelly is that she's, th this is something that's always been very important to her. That she wants, you know, a lot of times I go, hey, it doesn't matter to me, you know, throw a hot dog on there, I'm easy, you know. No, really, that's been my attitude. I mean, it's, it's like, I don't care. But Shelly goes, no, I want it to be special. And you got to ask yourself that, do you want it to be special? And I think a lot of times, though, guys, and I want to I address this to you, but, you know, a lot of times your wife doesn't want to make it special because she knows she's going to have to do all the work. And I'll talk about that later, but let me tell you something. We all chipped in. It was a, it was a family affair. Even today, I mean, I kind of miss the kids because they used to help out a lot more. So I, I have to do more work now, you know what I'm saying? But we, we all did our part. We all did our part. But, you know, the dinners, you know, we, we'd have, uh, we had a few people living with us at the time there in New York. But, but kids would, this one girl, I remember a friend of Jennifer's, would come over every night almost right around dinner time. Because she said, she said, you know, my mom never cooks. You know, or she does, she just grabs a pizza here or there, whatever else, and she goes, I love to come over, I love to spend time with you. And, you know, she loved the atmosphere. She loved to be there with us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was laughing, we're, we're, you know, discipling each other at the table. Every, you know, somebody had to make the salad, somebody had to do the cleanup, somebody did this, that, whatever else, but we all worked as a team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that you, you just cannot underestimate the impact that has on people's lives the people coming around second thing I want to talk about is is the atmosphere mm -hmm. you know if you look over in John chapter 13 it's amazing how, how much Jesus made things special John 13 you know the Last Supper you know Jesus sent sent people ahead to prepare for the Last Supper to get it ready to make it special Okay, but, but I love this right here. You know, in verse 2 it says, The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already um, 
Actually, let's start in verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he, showed the, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, if you've ever had anybody wash your feet before, I've had, I've had someone do that for us before, a couple that we used to disciple. It's a very special thing, especially if you've ever smelled my feet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's a major sacrifice. And, you know... But what I want to talk about right here is that, you know, Jesus, Jesus didn't just have, an, didn't, didn't, didn't have a meal for the last meal. He created an atmosphere. It was in the upper room. He sent ahead. I mean, it, it was planned out. I mean, they must have had servers there. You know, he purposely didn't have a servant there to wash their feet because he wanted to do it himself. Okay? And because uh, he wanted to create the right kind of atmosphere. That atmosphere, they would remember that forever. They would remember what he did. They remember what they ate. They remember, you know, what was talked about that night. Jesus created those kinds of uh, situations. And, and the, whole, you know, the whole idea of creating an atmosphere where people come in and they really want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, um, I'm a professional woman and have been longer than I've been a Christian. And yet, and in that, I work in a profession that's mostly men in, in my particular area. And... Uh, and yet, when I think about my home, I feel like it is my responsibility to create the atmosphere in my home. I don't see that as being a joint responsibility. I feel like the, the atmosphere, making it home, making it special, making it comfortable, has to come from my heart. And I, I put a lot of effort into that to make my home attractive and comfortable for my family and for anybody else who wants to come in there, that it's just, it's home. And you can come in and take food out of the refrigerator and you can take your shoes off and lay on the couch and you can, you know, that it's a comfortable home for anybody who comes into it and that they, that they would immediately feel like family. And I think as women, we have to nurture that in our own hearts especially LA women I've noticed really struggle with this whole concept of nurturing and home and feminine things and you know I mean it's incredible to me because um, you know my daughter when she was in third grade was asked by her teacher what I did and she goes oh my mom's a housewife I'd, I've never been a housewife I've always I, I had both my kids when I was doing my PhD and I went right into the university I have never been at home. And uh, yet, that's what Jennifer saw of my life because home was so special to me. And I didn't bring, you know, everything into my home. My home was my home, and you didn't mess with that. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a big part of this hospitality is that it can't be a show that you put on when somebody comes to your house, you know. It's got to be who you are all the time. And that when your children look back and when your husband thinks about home, they think about a secure, safe, warm, loving environment. That's hospitality. It's not necessarily the, where the candlesticks are placed on the table, although that may even communicate something too, but it's your heart, and it's the way people feel when they come into your home. You know, uh, we, we get a kind of a kick out of this, but I, uh, I do a lot of discipling through my hospitality. Brothers and sisters. Um, the sisters are there because I'm always trying to teach them how to be hospitable. And when they come to my house, I bring them in the kitchen and they help out and, you know, they're just a part of it. Um, the brothers like to be in the kitchen. And when they're in the kitchen, I take that opportunity, too, to work with them. And, yeah. and so we, we kind of have this joke, you know, about stay out of Shelly's kitchen if you don't want to be discipled. But, you know, it's... That's a part of hospitality, too. It's not just what you feed people physically. It's you wanting them in your home, making them a part of your family, and climbing into their lives. You know, and that's what Jesus did. He, he picked, he used hospitality to really, at times when he really had to do something profound in somebody's life. 
um, and, and we see it here in the Last Supper, but there's just something about sitting down at a meal together and having a serious discussion that goes deeper. It has a bigger impact. It has more of a reflection of love to it. And we, we use our hospitality that way in our, in our family and with our friends. People um, have oftentimes commented on, we're big believers in family devotionals, and um, we still do them every Sunday. Our kids are 20 and 19 now. And we, we haven't missed very many Sundays in all these years that we've been Christians. And uh, we still have our family devotionals, and we include other people in our family devotionals. The kids now bring um, college students, we have all these college students that come, and they just love it. I mean, they cry. They'll actually cry sitting in one of our family devotionals because they've never been in a home where you had a family. And that's becoming more and more like our society. And so, you know, to bring somebody into your home and to make them feel like they can be part of your family too, just, I mean, it's amazing what it does to lift somebody's heart. And I think sometimes we don't do that, frankly, because we get selfish. Uh And we think, well, now I've given, you know, especially in the kingdom, we, we sacrifice a lot. But, you know, you don't ever see Jesus doing that, really. I mean, the guy, you know, was always giving. And he'd, go, he'd try to relax a little bit. There'd be a need. He'd take care of the need. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I know that's the thing, really. I mean, of all the things I remember about my Christian life that had the, probably the biggest impact on me, I, I always say this, is going over to Bromley's <laughs> yeah, house. I mean, it, you know, it just had a tremendous impact yeah. on me. And I think uh, we, we've got to have that attitude. You know, I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. He says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, mm-hmm. but our lives as well because you've become so dear to us. You know, that's what hospitality is. It's sharing your life, yeah. you know. And um, I appreciate that about Shelly because, I mean, even um, she, she doesn't have to do a lot of the stuff she does. I think sometimes people think that, you know, she's, what's wrong with you? Calm down. You're, you're too excessive. But it's an expression of how she can serve people and how to love people. You know, every, every semester she has a group of UCLA students, they're medical students, that she works with, kind of a smaller group, and uh, she invites them over for a meal. And uh, it's not just, you know, any kind of a meal. It's an awesome meal. I mean, we, we make it special. And, um, you know, every time, I mean, it's amazing. Every time those kids come over, they come over like about 7 o'clock. Last time we had one, mm-hmm. they, we're all showing up at 6 o'clock. You know, we're, <laughs> we're trying was, to get ready. That was, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but they don't leave till like midnight. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, and, 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 and here again, I mean, that's, that's hard. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, you know. We have the song we sing, you know, we love you with the love of the door, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but people, you know, people don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. And, and no kidding, she, uh, her students love her. She gets the, the highest evaluations, not just because she cooks for them, but because she makes it special. I mean, you know, it, it even, it, she'll go to work and she'll take like a basket of cookies or something while they're grading the exams. Little things like that. <clears throat> You know, they really have an impact. You go, but, well, I don't have time to do that. You know, I'm too busy. How does she do it? Well, we're going to talk about that next. It's called, it, that's our third point. It requires planning. Yeah. You've got to be organized. You've got to be disciplined. Look over Luke chapter 9. Okay. <clears throat> Luke 9. <clears throat> Look at verse 12. It says, late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only, you know, five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go, you know, and buy food for this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. You know, a lot of times we get overwhelmed with our schedules. Or we get overwhelmed with, the, we don't have a lot of money maybe for hospitality. I mean, they were overwhelmed right here. This, yeah. We're talking 5,000 people, yeah. you know. He goes, hey, man, send them over to McDonald's. Send them over to Burger King. Let's yeah. get them out of here, you know. He said, you feed them. He said, but, you know, but this is what I've got. I've only got this many fish, this much time, this much money. But look at this. But he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Let me tell you something. That had an impact on those disciples. Mm-hmm. They never forgot that. It's recorded, I believe, in three out of the four Gospels. Okay. I mean, that, that had a major impact on them because, because Jesus cared about people. And I think a lot of times, you know, 
uh, you know, he had to come up with a quick plan here. But, you know, a lot of times we don't do that. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't, we, 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 we look at our life like, what's quick? What's expedient? You know, there, there was, a, there was a, a married couple over in the West. And I hate to even say this, but, I mean, it's kind of indicative of where we're at today. But they've been married for a year, and we found out that she had never cooked a meal for him in the one year of marriage. I mean, that was terrible. You know, but I mean, that, that's kind of where, you know, where a lot of people grow up nowadays. I mean, it's like, you know, this is not there. Of course, she repented. And we're working with her on that. You know what I'm saying? But, but guys, you know, it, it takes planning. And I, I really want to lift Shelly up for this. I mean, from the time we were first married... We used to go around, I remember, you know, in college together. We got married while we were still in college. Had both our kids while we were in graduate school. You know, we were poor of the poor, let me tell you. We used to have all these little clickers, you know. It was like pennies, dimes, and nickel. I don't know what it was. But you go around, you know, you go around the store, you know, and you click this thing because we had, like, so much money to spend on groceries everywhere. It's like $20 or $30. I can't remember, you know. We're, you know, it was back in the old days. But, but she, we'd go around and click all this stuff. But she would work up the whole menu for the week you know, before we went to the store. So she would know what we were doing. You know, she started doing that when we first got married. She still does it today. It doesn't take her forever. So then when she goes to the store, she buys what we need for food for that week. Okay, we get it. We've got it. It works. You know, it's not rushing out the last minute, grab something here, there, wherever else. It's called being disciplined. You know, we're called to be that way. And you know, if you, husbands, if your wives are not that way by nature, you need to help them. Okay? Or maybe you just need to help them plan in that respect. I, you know, I mean, I'm fortunate in the fact that Shelly's very organized that way. But, but um, you know, we, we've got to help them if they're not that way. Amen? Mm -hmm. Oops. <clears throat> you know, planning is the secret to success in any area of your life. I mean, if you're not organized, you will not succeed in anything you try to do. And um, it's certainly true in being hospitable. What, what I, have to, I have a very, very tight schedule because I'm at the university all day, and because of uh, Greg's responsibilities with the eldership, I have usually two or three appointments every night. And so I don't have a lot of time to, uh, to, to prepare, and yet it's very important to me that meals are special. I mean, I have to try to make all this work. And so what I'll usually do is I'll sit down on Saturday morning, and I'll write down Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I, I go through my cookbooks, and I look at what my day is going to be like for each particular day. Like, for example, we have church on Wednesdays, so I know I'm not going to have a lot of time to prepare a big meal on Wednesday. But Tuesday of that week, I might have time. Or maybe if I'm going to be giving a lecture the next day, I'm not going to be able to do something big that night before me. I'm going to look at my schedule. And then after I look at my schedule, then I plan out what meal I'm going to have time to prepare that day. Or what could I start preparing on the weekend that I could pull out of the freezer and finish that day? Or what could I make a double amount of so that I'll have an extra for that day? And I'll, and I'll plan that through. Um, we have my family coming for a family reunion. I've already prepared homemade rolls, and they're in the freezer. I've already done the pie crusts. They're in the freezer. I took time before because I know I'm not going to have time. I have to teach all day Wednesday, and they get here Wednesday. So you got to, you know, people say, how do you do it? Well, you do it by planning ahead and you sometimes have to plan ahead several weeks to make sure that you are getting the right thing done and also I only go to the store once a week um, I'm on a tight budget and I try to do a lot of entertaining and I can't I can't afford every time I walk in the store I just spend a bunch of money so I go to the store once a week and when I make that grocery list everything I look at the recipe I write down everything I need I don't go buy everything that looks good at the store and then try to make a recipe out of it I go the other way because that's expensive. So what I do is I go through and I figure out my menu. And, and maybe it's like the double contribution week last week. Last week we had potato soup one night because all I need is potatoes, carrots, and onions. We had um, another soup the next night. We had spaghetti one night because I already knew what, I mean, this double contribution really kind of hit my budget hard. And so the only place I had any flexibility was with food. <laughs> and so I still fixed nice meals for my family, but... They were very inexpensive meals. And, you know, I, I had to think ahead on that to make sure that I, I wasn't going to have a problem. I am, I'm not big on uh, fast food at all. Um, I, you know, I, I honestly never uh, one time fed my children a TV dinner. They would beg me to let them go to McDonald's for dinner because I just didn't think it was healthy. I felt like, you know, steamed vegetables and, you know, something at home would be better for them 
than all this fast food. And so I've just never been a big fast food person. And so I have to sort of come up with my own fast food at home, things that I can do, and figuring out recipes that I can, that I can make happen quickly. And, you know, it's funny. My, my kids, for Christmas I got them a, a, this uh, vegetable steamer and rice steamer because that's what they want because now this is how they cook at home. And um, I think we've got to... Uh, we got to really examine, you know, what we're doing with our schedules. And if you really want to make things work, you're going to have to put some work into it. You know, it takes me about two hours to organize my schedule that way and to organize the menu and organize my week. That's a very important two hours spent because I don't walk into my house frazzled. And, you know, uh, um, three times last week, particularly since Devon moved in, because he's a single guy, and he thinks this is wonderful, he gets dinner every night, so he invites all his friends and all his studies to come over, too. And, you know, there have been some, some fish and bread nights where I've had to stretch a meal to feed three or four more people. I didn't know what was coming, but, but I can always do that because I think that way in the cooking. You know, that, okay, I need to be prepared in case somebody else shows up, and how am I going to stretch this thing? And, you know, it, it, it really, um, it's amazing the opportunities that open up when, when you're prepared and you can do something like that. And people know when they come to our house that they can eat. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of just what they expect, and, and that's what we try to make happen. And, and that makes them feel um, a lot more at home. And so I, I think a big part of this, sisters, really, is you have to get a hold on your schedules. I'm sure they're talking about that in the class next door. I hope, I hope they are, that, that you've You've got to sit down and plan, or you're never going to be able to be hospitable. Or even worse, you'll be such a wreck when the people come over that your family will say, please don't invite any more people over. This is not worth it. I mean, you are miserable before. You're miserable after. You're yelling at everybody instead of everything just sort of flowing along. I mean, it was funny. Jennifer had a, a household date at our house last weekend, and uh, she had 14 people over for dinner. And... Um, that all these girls were over there preparing this huge meal, this fancy wine chicken dish and salads and, and all this stuff. And all I was trying to do was get this salad ready. I had to take over to this pot like I was going to. And um, they blew out all the fuses in the kitchen. They were, they were having to fry the chicken uh, stuff in the bedroom. And I was having to wash my lettuce in the bathroom. And there was no lights. And, you know, and yet... We all just sort of got through that, and it was, it was memory-making. We created a memory. But, you know, part of the reason that Jennifer didn't just lose it and the whole thing become a disaster is that's happened to us a lot of times as we've tried to do these big things, and we've learned how to, you know, work through these meal times and make them fun even when they all kind of start falling apart. So it is a matter of planning and, and really being organized if you're going to be hospitable. Man. You know, I think a lot of times you, you can look at Shelly and go, well, she's just different. Yes. You know, <laughs> she's just different. Yeah, okay. yeah. Hi, Vicky. I admit it. I thought it. She does have a big heart that way. But I, I'll say this, though. She's also a disciple. Yeah. And she, she looked at Linda Brumley, and she said, I want a family like that. And she's willing to make the sacrifices for it to make that way. And if you ever go to Linda Bromley's house, they're very much like each other. They really are. Yeah. Um, Linda does a lot of her discipling in the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, she's always got, you know, fresh baked cookies there and all kinds of stuff like that. And you walk into their home. Now, if you ever go to the Bromley's house, and I mean, those of know the Bromley's know this is true. You walk in their house, you, you just feel like this is not a house, it's a home. Yes. And if you're hospitable, when people walk in, they're going to say, this is a home. And, I, you know, she does a lot of work like that. Let me just say this, brothers. I do a lot of work, too. Oh, yes, he does. I'm the, I'm the you know, i got to yeah. clean the floor. i got to clean up afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I'm not just sitting around, no, you know. No, no. And, uh, you know, but it does. If you're going to make things special for anybody, it takes some sacrifice. That's right. Yeah. Last point is just this. Point number four is got to go the extra mile. Look over in uh, John 21. Okay. Yeah. John 21. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Look at verse 11. It says, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of, lar I'm sorry, it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. 
None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. You know, you read the scripture, you go, here's a guy that's been crucified, went through the most intense thing of his, you know, you could ever go through, came back from the dead. If anything, you know, I think he'd want to be served at that point in time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why, don't you, why don't you cook for me? Yeah. What did he do, man? He went... Jesus always went the extra mile. Yeah. Somebody else cooked for a change. <laughs> but he did. He went the extra mile. He really did. And, uh, you know, guys, I mean, the, the, to be hospitable, I think everybody goes, oh, yeah, we ought to be more hospitable. But, you know, it's kind of like saying we ought to be more fruitful. Yeah. A, lot of be, a lot of people want to be more fruitful. Yeah. But guess what? You've got to deny yourself to be more fruitful. That's right. You've got to work hard if you're going to be fruitful. You've got to lay your life down for people if you're going to be fruitful. You know, being fruitful really is a part of, about being hospitable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, your, your life, sharing your life with someone, not just the gospel, has a tremendous impact on them. And you talk about discipling. You know, when people come in and they see your life, they see your family, and they see how you work together. You know, I know for me, here again, the Brumleys, I looked at that. They didn't have to teach me anything. I just looked at it. I go, I want that. And you've got to ask yourself, do people come in my house, and are they blown away? I mean, maybe they're blown away like, hey, mama, you know, what's going on here? You know, I mean, what? Yeah, that's the wrong kind. You know, they should walk in, and they should leave feeling relaxed. You know, you really you should have to, please leave. Please. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it should be the kind of thing where they don't ever want to leave, okay, uh, if we're really going to do that. You know what I'm saying, you know, I think going the extra mile, too, I, I mentioned my, uh, my negative feelings about fast food, but uh, I think the extra mile means, sisters, learning how to cook. It means figuring out that you can make a cake mix without a box. I've had sisters come to my house and say, you don't need to use a box to make a cake mix? I mean, I, I gave someone a homemade pudding recipe the other day, and she was blown away that you could make pudding without a box. And I think, you know... It, it really helped me a lot because when we went to India, there was no mixes. There was no nothing. I mean, I had to figure everything out from the raw item. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it was good that I had learned how to cook because then I could figure that out. Probably you aren't going to be going to India, but you are going to be in situations where you're going to have to pull something together without an instant mix. And, you know, that's a real shocking experience if you haven't taken the time to learn how to cook. And, you know, it's so funny. I am just amazed when people come over and they realize that the pumpkin bread on the table I made or, you know, that the rice was something I steamed. And the, you know, I mean, it's, they just are, they're just blown away. And I think that, that that's a statement of love that people need to see from us, that we are going to be willing to go the extra mile. And, you know, when you first start learning how to cook, it takes time. I mean, you've you got to wrestle through these recipes, and you've got to buy all these ingredients you probably don't have. And, I mean, even just get a couple recipes that are just you, you know, that, that you can bring out that make it special, that you've actually made. And, and the people will feel so loved by you. That, that you did that for them. And I think those are the kinds of things. Setting a table. You know, none of this takes any money. Actually, it, it will save you money if you start doing more of your own cooking. But setting a table and just, you know, putting a nice little table arrangement on there and cleaning up your house and making it look nice and neat. And, you know, I, I remember uh, Linda always telling me you, could, you knew a hospitable home because it was a home you felt comfortable dropping off there and taking a shower if you needed to. And then I, I remember going right home and looking in my shower to think, now what I want her to just run in here today. I mean, how would you feel if I decided, okay, I'm coming to your house with you now for lunch? You know, I mean, can you say, great, that would be wonderful. I am all set. I can figure this out, and it'll be a great meal. And that, that's a statement that you've gone the extra mile. When, when you can just drop everything and go come to my house i'm i am prepared and i want you to be with me it's too bad you know shelly put together these cookbooks for special contribution we should have brought some up here they're awesome they're awesome if you want them she sell them 10 bucks each they're going like hotcakes they're great we'll bring them amen
I just, I just want to close out with this, guys. You know, when Jesus sent out the 12, verse 11, it says, Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there, and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. And if it is not, let your peace return to you. You know, I wonder if Jesus came to our home, would he say it was a worthy home? Would he feel welcomed? Would he feel, hospi you know, like there was hospitality there? Would he feel special? Yeah. You know, I, I would hate to think that he'd ever come to one of our homes and just kind of wipe the dust off his feet and leave, go somewhere else. Guys, everything we do, we need, we, we need to make a statement mm -hmm. to the world mm -hmm. that we're different. Amen. And that means sacrifice. It means laying your life down. It means long nights. It means get up early sometimes. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, that's what our life's all about. And that's, that's how we're going to really change the world. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, pretty obvious why we had Greg and Shelley come on up and do a class on hospitality. So, amen. We know them personally. They are incredible. Uh, I want to say uh, just a couple things to emphasize here as we go out of here. Number one is they're sort of in the hospitality area. They sort of got the PhD, you know, in hospitality. I think a lot of us... Myself included, I'm very, you know, we're, we're, I'm convicted. We're a long way from that. Okay, but let's, let's just try to, you know, don't say, well, i got to get to having three people over every week, and, and you know, i got to cook at home every night, and, you know, all that stuff right away. But start wherever you're at. And, you know, let's, let's go ahead and graduate from, you know, let's get out of elementary school. Okay? <laughs> then we can go to junior high. Then we can go to high school. Then we can go to college. And eventually... You'll get your Ph.D. in hospitality. Hey, Amen. All right? But it's a worthy goal. I know there are a lot of us in here. Please understand. It came through loud and clear to me. You want to be people of impact. And you're wondering why you don't have more impact. You wonder why you, the people you disciple in your relationships are not more impactful. Why you don't, you're not more personally fruitful. This is a major thing. Right here. It multiplies your personal impact immensely if you take the time and start having people in your home and it is really not just a house but a home right. so I want to encourage you that last thing I want to say to all the guys I'm convicted personally I know a lot of our wives would love to do a lot more entertaining but they can't count on us and they don't want to go through the battle of having to they just feel like man if I do anything it's gonna be all me because you know I'm not sure my husband's gonna help out and you know we need to do help out in a major way and I can see where just listening to this today, I have slipped in, in that. I used to be a lot better about it than I am now. And uh, my wife's nodding her head. So, uh, amen. Uh, I agree. I agree. Oh, it was Colleen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I agree. Uh, this, I've been to a lot of marriage retreats. I've never heard a class on hospitality. But, uh, you know, this needs to be here. This is, uh, we're, we're blazing some new trails here, uh, but this needs to be here. Amen. Amen. Again, uh, great job, Mettons. Uh, let's uh, move quickly to our next class.